study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word. Poor Hagar. She has been uh, dispatched to her own people uh, at Sarah's um, request. And Abraham, though a very rich man, all he gives her is a loaf of bread and a bottle of water. That is to say, a skin bottle of water. And sends her off out into the desert. Which really, for as much as he loved the boy, uh, that was pretty skimpy. And had she, if she were, were she not an experienced desert person, uh, she couldn't make it, all right, at the place where he left her. So it makes you kind of wonder, but then when God has made a promise, when God is in charge, he intervenes in people's lives. Man, as in this case, Abraham, who was full of faith, and he's even honored because of his faith. As far as I'm concerned, he kind of dropped the ball. He could have given her animals. He could have given her servants that could carry enough food to get her back to her people. But he didn't. So she goes a ways into the desert by the wall, sure, in the Hebrew means wall. She sets the boy there, and then she goes off about an arrow's uh, uh, shoot, which would be a oh, couple hundred yards, let's say. No, that'd be too, well, but that'd be all right. Where she couldn't hear the boy's cries uh, before he died, and begin to open her heart up to God. And naturally, our Father is one of love. So there we pick it up. Let's see how God saves Hagar, where man fails and man lets you down, God will provide. Okay, chapter 21, verse 17, a word of wisdom from our Father. Let's go with it. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. In other words, don't ever think that when you cry out, God doesn't hear you. He does. Verse 18. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And certainly he did. There's a promise. There's a covenant. God always keeps his word. Verse 19. And God opened her eyes... And she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water, and gave the lad drink. Now, wells were basically, in this area, were hidden to a degree, or covered, because they were very valuable property, needless to say. And God simply, by sending her back to the lad and pointing her, directed her to this well, and it's important that you know this well, you can basically trace it, though we can't be positive yet. Um, it uh, would seem that it's going to ultimately be a very important well. It's not Ayan, you know, that's the um, circle in the old ancient Hebrew alphabet, uh, which means opening, uh, which would be a spring. It means spring also. It wasn't a spring. Nor was it a bore, which is simply a cistern, what we would call a cistern. In other words, water must be hauled and placed into it. But it was a barr, barr, which is to say a bitter. Uh, and uh, it means what? It's a dug well. That's the important point. Lock that away for a moment and let's continue. Verse 20. And, and uh, let's see, did we? Yes, verse 20. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. He was a hunter. And of course, he would become the father, if you would, of many of the Arab nations. And as much as he would have 12 sons, the same as the 12 patriarchs, uh, that is to say, dukes, they would be called in another book of the Bible and basically make up uh, through Ishmael the Arab uh, population of the world today. 21. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and uh, place of the caverns, and his mother took him a wife 
uh, out of the land of Egypt, which is where Hagar came from in the beginning. Verse 22. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the uh, chief captain of his host, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. In other words, um, Abimelech and uh, Phicol means strong, and this being his um, one of his chief captains, uh, no doubt he was a very strong personality, as well as as a soldier. But people notice someone that God truly blesses. And God did bless Abraham. Everything he touched basically prospered for him because he was the man of the covenant. His very name being changed from Abram to Abraham, meaning the father of many nations. So any way you look at it, you see that in part come to pass through this one lad, the son of Hagar, who was also the son of Abraham. And with those 12 sons uh, being basically the Arab world, we see that Abraham is actually in part the father of that uh, particular nation. But everyone around could see that God blessed Abraham. Now it is human nature, understand that, it is human nature in as much as Abimelech was a pretty good old boy and wanted to do what was right, the, um, he uh, naturally is going to take note and want to be a friend to observe, if nothing else, how he did things so that he could be blessed also. Verse 23. Now Abimelech continues, Now therefore swear unto me here by God, that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. In other words, um, the Philistines claimed this particular land. They cut a pretty wide swath, quite frankly. And, but they did claim this particular land, but told him, said, hey, live here, be with us. And, um, and there was no problems up until, verse 24, and Abraham said, I will swear. Now, uh, mark in your mind the word swear along with bir from above, the dug well. Uh, the two words uh, will play together for us here in a moment. Verse 25, And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. Now there would appear to be that well again. Verse 26, and Abimelech said, I would not what hath come, what hath done this thing, neither didst thou uh, tell me, neither yet heard I of it, uh, but today. In other words, this, was to this is totally news to me when Abraham jumps him out about it. And I'm sure that it probably was because he would not have allowed his people to violently take a well away from Abraham uh, when, um, when they had this covenant by oath, which is to swear between them. Verse 27. And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. In other words, uh, understand this real good. Abraham rendered good for evil. Um, and we see within that that his knowledge, his foreknowledge, perhaps I should say, of experience of having him for a neighbor, he knew and understood that this would be the best way to handle the situation. But he, here he, the one that has been offended, is giving a gift to the neighbor who his own people have done evil to Abraham. Think about it a minute. Rendered good for evil. Verse 28. 
And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. 29. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? Now, our Father's word lets us know that there is nothing new under the sun. Now, if you're not familiar with animal husbandry, a ewe is a, we'll say, a virgin sheep. All right? So we have seven virgin sheep set aside. Uh, this uh, cannot help but remind me of the 7,000 of God's elect that were set aside also. When we see the common sense and the knowledge working within this and knowing there's nothing new under the sun, then look at the various types that God sets forth, sets forth for us in, the, in that we can pick up, we can learn uh, very, uh, at a real easy pace, simply following what has been. Knowing the way our Father thinks, and that that he would have his prophets do, and simply he called Abraham a prophet in the last lecture, if you'll remember. So, they are set aside. And you know what? He's going to give them this good deed for one that was bad. Observe what happens. Next verse, please. Verse 30. And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. Now, to me then, this becomes very important because this well becomes very important. In other words, in taking these seven, in a sense, what he's saying, from my seed, uh, in the fact that I dug it, shall come the living waters. And naturally, it would be from the seed of Abraham that the true well, even that Christ would go to on that day where this woman would come forth and he would ask her for a drink. And she said, why would you even speak to me seeing that you're of the tribe of Judah? And she mentioned our father Jacob came to this well. And so this well plays well in history, uh, or the likeness of it. Can we say it's the same well? Well, let's be a little cautious on that. It, it's not concrete, but basically the well of Hagar, and uh, this well will be named Beersheba. And certainly um, Jacob's well, of which that one is in, what is it? It's the fourth chapter of John, I believe it is, that Christ went there. We see the living water, and he himself would say to that Samaritan woman, If I know a water that if you partake of it, you will never thirst again. So here we see the seven, yes, but at the same time we see from the seed of Abraham the living water that if you partook of, you would never thirst. Uh, so we have a great deal within this. Watch now as we continue, verse 31. Wherefore he called that place Barsheba, which is to say the uh, seven wells of the oath, if you would, because there they swear both of them. And if we were to take the etymology, uh, it derives uh, the name from uh, oaths, Sheba, taken by the party to the treaty. And basically what it means is to pledge oneself by seven. And seven, of course, being spiritual completeness. So the well then is named Beersheba, and we kind of get a little better fix of the well, okay? Verse 32. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech rose up, and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, and they returned into the land of the Philistines. So here we have the treaty. 
And incidentally, this uh, if if um, this if my understanding is correct, this well is still in use to this day. All right, it. Um, it, um, and we'll speak more of that as we continue in the book of, of uh, Genesis 33. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. I repeat, the eternal or everlasting God, 34. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. And the point being, of course, that they watered from the same well. That is to say, they got along by the fact that Abraham returned good for evil, as far as a neighbor is concerned, and it certainly paid great dividends. Though perhaps Abraham had had the well dug, for it was a dug well, a bir, that... Uh, uh, it was still land claimed by the Philistines and without war and without uh, damage they got along quite well and um, and uh, lived happily there for that long period of time. Now it's important Abraham planted a grove. Many times when the word grove is used uh, in the Old Testament, I will say, it means um, uh, Astaroth, Astaroth, which is to say it was a, a, a thing that was worshipped, an idol that was worshipped. And quite frankly, uh, it was phallic. So, uh, this is not that word. This word, uh, you with companion Bibles, uh, you will have a... Um, a fix on this that it was not an idol nor was it a grove to worship some idol within it was hard wood a hardwood grove that he planted here so that this would be a stopping place or a resting place and so it would be for a long time to come and because of the word grove used translated to, to English here I felt it necessary to draw that to your attention for grove worship by some was very evil not in this case the word is not the same chapter 22 and verse 1 again to lay a little groundwork there is nothing new under the sun God is going to give you through Abraham and Isaac an example of the crucifixion which would take place many, many years after this. But our Father shows you an example whereby you can experience the emotions that our Father felt when His only begotten Son died on the cross or was murdered on the cross, one that was perfect, without spot, without blemish. Now, Abraham has been promised that through this son Isaac, I mean, there's where the seed's going to be called, that the children are become, be going to be, they're going to become as numerous as the sands of the sea and the, uh, and the stars of heaven. Now God's going to tempt him. Well, let's go ahead and read 22.1 and we'll get that part of it and then I'll lay a little more groundwork. And the first verse, and it reads, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Now, don't read too much into the word tempt. Uh, uh, to um, prove would be a better way of translating it. He's going to prove him. Now, if, uh, and many might say, well, why would God do that to someone? Well, it's quite simple. He's, he's cut this, this old boy out a pretty heavy load to carry. I mean, he's promised him he's going to be the father of many nations. And if he can't cut it, now's the time to find out. And many times you might think of it in your life, oh, woe is me. Well, hey, sharpen up. God proves his servants. And if you're a servant of God, he's going to prove you. 
No man will go into battle, and I'm speaking in a spiritual sense now, with a weapon that he hasn't proven. And God, one of God's weapons for his war against Satan is you. And if he can't prove you that you've got it, that you can cut it, that you're a can-do type person, I, I doubt that he'll be using you. Now, there are many uh, levels. Some people maybe are even handicapped and can't move arms or legs. But they are faith warriors to, that would frighten Satan and his demonics totally out of the state. So understand what I'm saying and don't anyone be offended by my terminology of can-do type people. He's not going to tempt Abraham. He's going to prove him because he doesn't want some hot house, sweet-livered uh, reverend trying to lead his people. He wants a can-do type person that can cut the mustard. Let's put it that way. That's a good old Arkansas saying, or I should say Southern saying that uh, it's a Northern saying too, come to think about it. Well, that's good. We all understand. Uh, they in Europe might have a little trouble with it, but that's, it means you, you can do it. All right? Verse, so with that, verse 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. Now relate that to the only begotten son of God, Jesus, okay? Whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, uh, again, as I stated, I hope this strengthens you that there are no surprises in God's word. Do you know, uh, do you know what Mariah? You've heard that song, they call the wind Mariah. Well, uh, perhaps that's off a of key there or an octave, but be that as it may. It means chosen by God or provided by God. Now, the most important question, do you know where it is? And Moriah happens to be a set of peaks of which one is Zion and the other is what we call Calvary. The very same hill on which Christ was crucified. So, uh, and, and the Mount of Olives is, is figured in the, the group of Moriah as well. It all took place there. But I have no doubt in my mind, inasmuch as God told him, it will be the hill I will pick. I will show thee that there is no mind, uh, there is no room in my mind for doubt that it was Calvary, Golgotha, the skull, whatever language you speak or wish to call it in, all the same. So he takes his son there and here, now stop and think about this a moment. Grasp the full uh, meaning here. And then you could understand Abraham's faith. God, and he believes God, has said through this son, I'm going to multiply the people. Well, if you're going to offer somebody for sacrifice, the non-believer would say, oh, that's it, it's all over. But Abraham knew that God would still use Isaac, because he had stated so, that he could raise him from the dead and make a savior out of him and still bring forth the peoples and would bless the whole world. Well, in a sense, in the spiritual sense, that's exactly the type that Isaac was becoming at this moment. Because indeed, through Christ, whom, whomsoever will believe upon him, this same spot, Moriah, Golgotha, Calvary, whatever you want to call it, and um, there on that hill, Christ would be crucified and those that would believe upon him their sins would instantly be washed away. Washed away down the slopes of Moriah into the brink and washed away forever right to Satan's own dungeon. My words. 
He made that possible. So do you understand the workings of God? But yet at the same time, he wants Abraham to feel his emotions, or probably better said, he wants you today to feel his emotions. Uh, how much he loved his only begotten, who was perfect, hadn't done one thing wrong, that he would sacrifice him for you. I, I could say, well, are, are we worth it? Well, I doubt that. But at the same time, he loves us. And the love of a father for his child, and you are his child, will cause that father to do many things. To see that that child has the security if the child has faith to believe in the father. So this just kind of gets it right down to the nitty gritty of the emotions of God, of Abraham, and yes, we have another involved, Isaac. Because it's Isaac that this is about to happen to. Okay, let's have the next verse, please. And we go to verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him. Too bad he couldn't have sent two of them along with Hagar, huh? And Isaac, his son, I'm, I apologize for bringing that in here, but I can't help it, all right? And took his uh, young men with him, and Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. I wonder if he took that from Beersheba, the grove planted there, wood for even the sacrifice. Verse 4. Then on the third day, now underline that in your mind. How long was Christ in the tomb? Three days and into the next. So that you see the passion involved within this. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Four. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. That, that's an interesting saying. We will come again to you. He knows he's going to sacrifice him, so there's not one ounce of doubt, not one little mite of doubt in Abraham's mind that God, even if Isaac is sacrificed, is going to raise him from the dead and he's coming back. Six. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together, the father and the son carrying their own cross, which was the wood for the fire. So I, I want you to see the replica or the example, seven. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I my son and he said behold the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for a burnt offering poor old Isaac I mean it's beginning to look a little sparse because the only thing left that they haven't brought with them is the sacrifice and he doesn't know it but he's it now how do you think Abraham must have felt in his heart. This, this is his son that he and Sarah waited so long for. Think about it. Loved with all his heart. He's about to kill him. Think about it. Eight. Has the boy done anything? Of course not. He's a perfect lad. Well, as perfect as a lad can be. Verse eight. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. No doubt, and of course God would provide the sacrifice. It would be Emmanuel, God with us, himself if you understand. Nine. And they came to the place which God had told him of. In other words, it's important you know 
God provided Moriah, that's being the, the uh, translation rather than the transliteration, God picked the spot. That's why I have no doubt in my mind that it was Calvary. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Hey, we're getting, this is getting heavy. We're to the place. Ten. And Abraham stretched forth his hand. He raised up his hand with the knife and took the knife to slay his son. Eleven. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. Twelve. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, or that you reverence God, revere God, translated, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Neither would God withhold his only son from us. That is to say, Emmanuel, God with us. Abraham was proved. Abraham was stamped. Can-do type person. Abraham was stamped a faithful follower of God's command. Heavy stuff, friend. Stop and think about it. 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. That's, that's a full-grown adult male sheep. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. God provided a sacrifice exactly as he had stated. 14. And Abraham called the name of that place. I, I'm sorry, I cannot. I, um, my spirit will not let me read this as it is translated. I'm going to pronounce it rather as it is in the manuscripts. Yahweh Jireh. And, uh, and uh, Jire, Jire, rather. Jire means God will provide. Well, I believe it'll tell us here. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And what this means is, in the Hebrew tongue, Yahweh will provide. Do you believe that? It's important that you do. If you ever need a supply, you better know what name to ask it in, the name that God provides. Yahweh Jireh. So, there you have it. And God did provide. He provided the sacrifice. But inasmuch as there's nothing new under the sun, He would provide His own Son as the sacrifice on the same Mount Moriah chosen by God for even the place was chosen by God where these deeds would take place showing you that your father is totally in charge much more than mere man might think as he stumbles through this flesh life there are no new things under the sun and you can take strength and great courage in what is written in the examples your loving Father has set forth for you whereby you can believe. Psalms 22, as it was played out and as it came to pass on Calvary in that passion of the Lord. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please?